And now, please welcome our last speaker, Dr. Pro uh, Professor Elena Borsi. Sorry, Dr. Elena, for your name. <laughs> Borsovna Smilianskaya. Is that right? Okay. <laughs> professor Elena is a professor of Russian history in the National Research University, Higher School of Economics in Moscow. She is the author of more than 100 articles in Russian, English, Polish, and Polish. The title of her paper today is Collecting Arts of Imperial Needs, Acquisitions of Russian Military Men and Diplomats in Levant during the Russo-Turkish War of 1768-1777. Please welcome her. Thank you. First of all, I want to express my gratitude to the Orientalism Museum in Qatar for this incomparable opportunity to take part in this conference. I'm not an art historian, and I came across to the documents and that I want to present here uh, during my work on uh, the history of the first Russian expedition to Mediterranean during the uh, Russia uh, uh, Russo-Turkish War of 1768-1774. And uh, I will start my uh, presentation with uh, uh, this uh, two quotations about five squadrons. The archipelago expedition in conjunction with the Russo-Turkish War of 1768-1774 began Russian militaries uh, and military and political presence in the Eastern Mediterranean. Catherine the Great made everything in her foreign office upside down, and a special attention was paid on diplomatic support of this military expedition. Russian ambassadors in London and Copenhagen secured British and Danish help for Russian squadrons that had to sail from the Baltic Sea from St. Petersburg to Aegean around the whole Europe. British consuls on Minorca and in Livorno were also engaged in the enterprise on the Russian side. Uh, without this British help, I must uh, point uh, this uh, because I'm in London, without the British help, the expedition was hardly possible. Military uh, success of this expedition is well known. The great victory of Chesma in uh, June 1770 helped to realize many former dreams. Catherine called these dreams Spanish castles. Uh, to block, uh, so she, uh, this helped to realize these dreams, uh, to blockade the capital of the port to become in 1774 uh, masters of maritime transportation in the Levant, and to inspect all the ships, both uh, Turkish and European, sailing in this region. Um, in uh, 1771, about 30 islands in southern Aegean accepted Admiral Spiridov's proposal. Admiral was the chief of the expedition at that time. Proposal to become subjects of the Russian emperors. And the elders and clergy of these islands asked the empress to accept into eternal protection and patronage the unhappy archipelago. This part of the uh, military history of the Mediterranean presence of Russia is uh, uh, not very well studied. That is why I started my last uh, book with uh, uh, the, the documentation of the expedition and especially about uh, this um, proposal and about the subjecthood of 30 Greek islands to Russia. In 1774, after the peace treaty of Kuchuka in Ardu, uh, Russian fleet had to abandon the eastern Mediterranean and archipelago and uh, leave behind their Greek subjects, the incomplete but uh, very well done military base uh, on the island of Paris. 
and the allies, even in Syria and Palestine, who wanted to be their subjects too. Uh, Catherine's subjects. Russia changed its Levantine and archipelago possessions on new territories in the northern Black Sea region and the independence of Crimea from the port. But uh, beyond foreign affairs and the military history of the expedition, uh, uh, the expedition radically changed uh, the Russian image of the Levant and the, of the people there. And the, in this paper, I intend to argue two aspects. The first is uh, the changing images of Greeks that uh, Christian Orthodox Greeks during the expedition appear, appeared for Russians to be orientalized or spoiled by the Ottoman yoke. And the second uh, issue is a change in image of the Middle East, uh, that uh, where Muslims appeared not to be enemies, uh, but uh, to become Russian allies in Egypt and Syria. And uh, finally, how these changing images influenced Russian acquisitions uh, in this land, from these lands. I will start about Greeks. In the uh, 1770s, Russian diplomatic agents through the Europe, uh, th through the European press, and uh, the Empress herself, uh, through her correspondence, especially with uh, Voltaire, tried to present the first archipelago expedition primarily as an attempt to liberate suppressed co-religionists, and only secondly to attack Turks from the West. Russian intervention during the war was, uh, wel uh, was welcomed by the Greek population, which heralded the Russians as its liberators in the face of the Ottoman oppression. For Russians, the Greek idea seemed to be the idea of a common faith that influenced the political course of Russian rulers for many centuries. At the very same time, the Russian empress and her circle shared also the enlightened enthusiasm for the classical world. As such, the Russian military expedition was interpreted as a cultural mission to the cradle of an antique civilization that had been trampled by barbarians. And uh, um, here now we can see uh, an image, official image of Russian victories over, over Turks that uh, was uh, painted by Italian Stefano Torelli, who, who in 1762 appeared in St. Petersburg, uh, became an official painter of Catherine II, and uh, in 1772 he presented this picture. We can see here uh, this mixture of Christian and uh, uh, classical antique elements, uh, uh, as well as uh, orientalized corners of uh, Muslims who are also depicted here uh, in their admiration of uh, the Russian Athens. Catherine II, Athens or Minerva. Uh, she preferred to be Minerva uh, in uh, some pictures. And uh, especially with this Greek priest nearby ruins of an antique temple. And this mixture, uh, here we can see also a lot of types of Balkan Christians who surround the empress as well as her uh, warriors were, and uh, there are, uh, for example, Alexey Arlov, who uh, is uh, the chief of the archipelago expedition, and Grigory Arlov here, who was the main favorite of Catherine at that time, and uh, he was uh, possibly the inventor of this Greek idea of the archipelago expedition as well. Uh, so this is an official version of uh, 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 the Russian intervention into archipelago. Uh, the second, uh, uh, the second uh, that I 
just found on the Isle of Tinos in the Aegean. Uh, this island of Tinos was among these 30 islands that accepted Russian subjecthood. Not a Russian subjecthood, they became subjects of Catherine the Great, but uh, it is almost the same at that time. It was almost the same. And so on, uh, a Christ on uh, Tinus was divided at that time into two parts, Catholic and Orthodox. Uh, and uh, Greek Orthodox population of a very small village of Campos uh, that was surrounded by Catholic uh, monasteries and villages asked Alexey Arlov to help them to complete their church. They uh, uh, were allowed to complete it and uh, the help appeared under uh, the, under the, uh, uh, I forgot this word, uh, well, if Greeks uh, will give the church the name, will consecrate the church to uh, the, uh, to St. Catherine, who was the uh, saint protector of the Russian empress. So uh, this uh, St. Catherine's church in this small, very small, really, now there are only five families there uh, in the uh, village of Campos, they have this 18th century, possibly it, is, uh, uh, it was done by a Greek sculpture in uh, uh, 1772 or 1773, there is a court of farms of the Russian Empire, two eagles with St. George on its chest. And uh, it is an ordinary uh, court of arms, and uh, the Greek uh, sculpture could find this image on every Russian coin that were dispersed in Greek archipelago of that time. But what is absolutely uh, uh, incomparable are these two figures uh, uh, in uh, pointed caps and uh, in these uh, uh, trousers, pantaloons, uh, that uh, could never appear on Russian court of arms. And uh, uh, possibly he depicted Greeks with their crosses. Uh, the second cross has disappeared already, but with their crosses, coming to the Russian court of arms, coming to Russian empress in order uh, to uh, gain a protection. So uh, we can see this popular image and that previous one was of Tarelis. Oh, sorry, another one. I'm sorry, I switched off, okay. <laughs> uh, okay. So, um, so um, for Russians, the Greek idea uh, seemed to be the idea of a common faith. At the beginning of 1770s, the sponsors and the members of the Russian expedition imagined the Greeks whom they were going to liberate as uh, Spartans holding an orthodox cross as in their hands. Not like this orientalized uh, Greek so with crosses that appeared on uh, the Tinos coat of arms, but uh, um, in another way. Uh, preliminary information uh, received from the Balkan region assured Catherine II that uh, the Greeks were ready to take arms against the Turks and that if the Russian fleet comes to the Eastern Mediterranean, the Greeks would become combatants in the war against the Ottoman Empire. But from the first actions, in Peloponnesus, in the spring of 1770, the image of Christian Spartans was disabused. After failures in Maria, many illusions about orthodox unity dissipated. The Russians started to criticize the Greeks for their inability to fight in a regular army against their enemies. Even that Maniots, traitors and robbers prevented Maria from the use of the Greek liberty. 
the word about the uh, these words about the degradation of the Greeks who forgot their ancient Greek liberty appeared in Russian documents in the 1770s as they appeared in Western travel literature uh, since the end of the 17th century. The difference between Western and Russian points of view, however, was the origin of the decline of the classical culture in Greece. Western travelers and writers blamed not only the Turks in the degradation of culture, but also the Byzantine Orthodoxy and the Greeks uh, and the Great Schism of 1054 uh, in the degradation of Greeks culture. That is why in the search for ancient ideals, uh, Westerners often desired to find an almost mythical imagined Greece, the land of Iliad, the land of Odysseus. Russians in the 18th century, of course, didn't blame the great schism as Byzantine was considered to be the mother of the Christianity in Russia. But Russian found it out at that time that modern Greeks were very much spoiled by Oriental laziness. And uh, uh, here uh, we can see uh, the image of Alexei Arlov uh, by a known painter, uh, late 18th century, surrounded by uh, this possibly Spartans, uh, this orientalized Greek women. And uh, it, is, uh, it is so-called our love with grateful Greeks whom he came to liberate. Uh, but um, uh, this uh, next image, uh, this is uh, the very popular only in Russia, the image of uh, the Greek dance on the Isle of Paris. This is a very popular print everywhere in Europe, but in this uh, version, Greeks were dancing nearby the fish boat. But in Russian version, they are dancing nearby the temple. Uh, and it is uh, impossible uh, uh, to, to find a temple like this uh, in Paris. Paris uh, uh, had, has no temples. It has marble caves and has an uh, incomparable, beautiful uh, Christian 8th century uh, cathedral, Panagia uh, Cantonta Pagliani, but no temples like this. It is not the ignorance of Russians that they depicted on Paris this temple nearby this group of dancing orientalized Greeks. Uh, no, uh, uh, Russians knew Paris and described it very well. Uh, dozens of different descriptions of Paris because Paris was the place of Russian military base. In the uh, Bay of Nausa, they created this base and uh, 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 possibly they even imagined to uh, have this military base even after the peace treaty. But uh, you see that for Russian Greeks had to be in front of ancient temples, although they were considered to be co-religion. So um, this uh, um, Russians gradually, uh, uh, but before this, I will show Greeks. Um, Russians gradually lost their patience with the Greeks and became irritated with them uh, very soon. In January 1771, for instance, Spiridov, who at that time was very much inspired by the idea of, a build, of building a new Greek state on Archipelago Islands, wrote, the Greeks, because of their situation, deserve pity rather than criticism from us because they fear the Turks. Like child, they fear the Turks. Soon, however, such ideas were replaced by statements about the laziness and cunning of Greek subjects of Catherine the Great. Uh, so uh, next month, on February 1771, Spirit of wrote, I advise your excellency, he wrote it to his vice admiral, uh, to trust the Greek witnesses no more than your dreams and examine their stories very carefully. Captain Kokovtsev expressed uh, uh, a common Russian opinion about uh, Greeks um, and wrote, the Greeks 
who live in the archipelago and who prospered under the rule of Catherine the Great from 1771 till 1775, only four years, uh, now live in ignorance and poverty and barely get enough from their harvest to survive. The reason is their laziness, ignorance, and disorganized Turkish rule. They use their wits for trickery, falsehood, and hypocrisy. Greed rules their hearts. If they see any occasion to make a profit, they are happy to sacrifice their best friends and relatives to the last of metal coins. Their main pastime is listening to and telling fables. They are superstitious, jealous with, when it comes to women, and like Turks, they keep their women locked up. Uh, about women locked up, uh, it is the same uh, as Catherine discussed with Voltaire. Voltaire uh, asked her to capture Constantinople because Turks are uh, having their women locked up. Uh, so, uh, from this perspective, collecting ancient monuments from people who do not respect their past seemed almost to be a duty of Russian enlightened warriors. But in Russian instructions, this duty appeared not from the very beginning of the expedition. Uh, Catherine never mentioned uh, this idea uh, before, uh, I suppose, uh, uh, almost the last year of this expedition. But in 1771, a former Russian ambassador in London uh, and uh, the chief of admiralty, uh, Count uh, Chernyshov, Ivan Chernyshov, uh, wrote to Admiral Spiridov to Archipelago, asking him to send him the marble from the Isle of Paros that is considered to be the best, not the Isle, but the marble, and any statue, even without a head or a part of a capital, and carefully deliver it to St. Petersburg on a transport ship. Chernyshov at that time had completed his classical one of the best, uh, uh, this very big building. Now it is uh, on this place, there is a Mariinsky Palace, but this building impressed the whole Russian capital greatly. And uh, Chernyshov deserved for this classical building, uh, of course, a classical decoration. Uh, the same with uh, uh, his uh, rival, competitor, Baron Alexander Stroganov. He wanted also ancient monuments for his residence. And Stroganov, uh, by the way, was more successful to buy a certain sarcophagus. Uh, according to Stroganov himself, it was bought, uh, brought to him from one of the archipelago islands, and uh, uh, it was uh, Arlov's uh, um, uh, the, uh, uh, an officer from the circle of Arlov, and a future uh, president of, of the Russian Academy of Sciences, Sergei Damashnev, who bought it for Stroganov, this uh, sarcophagus, but uh, for uh, more than one century, this, uh, the place for this sarcophagus was in Dacha of uh, Stroganov. Uh, it is now uh, part of St. Petersburg, but it was a former Dacha on the Chorne Rechka, uh, Black River. And uh, it was depicted in the 19th century there in this nice garden. Only uh, in the after uh, 1917, the sarcophagus was taken from this dacha to the state hermitage, and uh, it is uh, considered now to be uh, not, of course, the sarcophagus of Homer, but the Roman work of the second century AD. Uh, but it is uh, in the main ex exhibition of Saint Hermitage. The Chernyshov's idea to collect ancient marbles on Archipelago Islands at at first made Admiral Spiridov embarrassed, as the Empress him herself never ordered this for the expedition staff. The Admiral answered his chief that the marble on Paros is not so good. It is only white, without any other colors, that all the ancient statues had been already taken away by foreigners or to Constantinopolis. 
but then in his next letter, promised to deliver to Count Chernyshov. He was his chief of Chernyshov. Only newly cut marble blanks. He added, all ancient statues and other things will be collected for imperial collections of Catherine the Great. Here there appeared the idea of collecting uh, arts for uh, imperial needs by uh, Russian warriors in archipelago. Next year, in uh, 1772, uh, Captain Ivan Borisov reported that Lieutenant Matvey Kakovtsev, a lover of antiquity, whom he sent to the island of Samos, found in the village of Mitali, Mitalin, three pieces of marble, which were then loaded onto the frigate. Also on Samos were founded columns from the temple of the goddess of Juna were brought, these um, columns were brought to the shore and loaded up on ships. On March 19, 1772, Nicholas Pungale, a Greek in the Russian service, was di dispatched to the island of Kea, whose inhabitants found an idol of a goddess in bad condition. And uh, it was uh, oh, 20 Greek workers brought down this uh, uh, marble statue to the seashore. In his report, Pungala promised to make every effort not only to bring down more of that marble to the shore, but also to load up onto the Russian ships every marble he will find. In uh, uh, February 1772, Lieutenant Vasily Payarkov also acted on, on spirit of instructions, was loading pieces of marble on dealers, having already brought down to the shore up to 50 marble pieces. It is not entirely clear what was brought to Russia from the numerous marble sanctuaries of dealers. The descriptions of military men are very brief. From the temple of Apollo, some of them with Greek writings, ancient words, about uh, 92 tones in total. That is all. I asked my colleagues in uh, the State Hermitage to just to compare, because there is a weight. And they measured these uh, pieces of marble, but they say we have so many pieces that uh, possibly we will have time to compare this with uh, your documentation. So I cannot give you proper images. It is five years already that I'm waiting. <laughs> Uh, on the island of Santorini uh, in Tira in 1771, uh, Spiridov also ordered a search for an ancient marble pieces for the court of the empress and collected at least a dozen of barriers. The description of the ancient acquisitions by the archipelago expedition made it perfectly clear that military commanders did not strive to show off their knowledge of ancient sculpture and usually did not dare to identify the discoveries. These objects were carefully packed and sent to the court. They originally, en they originally ended up in the Academy of Arts, but in 19th and 20th centuries, many of the marble monuments monuments brought from the archipelago became part of the Hermitage collection of antiquities. So, Russians came to the Eastern Mediterranean to liberate descendants of the ancient Greeks. Their own investigations on archipelago islands proved a principal interest in ancient Greek and Roman monuments. They were very disappointed to meet a different orientalized Greeks, and this disappointment influenced the negative attitude towards the present day Greek culture and oriental objects of art as well. Nevertheless, references to oriental objects step by step appeared in documentation. Orthodox Greeks became first art dealers of this specific market. The most unfortunate was a case with an Egyptian mummy that a Greek from Mykonos, Kyriak figure, a certain person, never knows, uh, uh, no, no, sold for the Russian commandment for 1,400 Venetian talas. A, describing a long story how he had acquired this Egyptian mummy. 
Admiral Spirit have considered it to be a proper object for the happiness of uh, the uh, Russian Empress, and uh, very soon found out that the mummy was false, and that its trader had already ran away to Istanbul, and all the state money were spent in vain. All the house of this uh, Kiryak figure was arrested. They counted all his uh, uh, very uh, modest um, uh, furniture, but of course could not cover the expenses. An inspection of all this sh or um, uh, the second way to get some oriental objects uh, was the inspection of all the ships sailing in Levant and uh, arrests of all the Turkish and a number of European ships um, uh, uh, that uh, uh, things that were arrested were considered to be um, prizes. Among these oriental objects, prizes of uh, military uh, time uh, was oriental armory, sabers, bows, arrows, silk, oriental dress, small and big chests, a lot of not very expensive objects of Turkish applied arts and crafts. These objects were sold for Russian members of the expedition and were taken to St. Petersburg or the other ports in Russia to decorate possibly uh, the life of Russian uh, nobility. Among these prizes, there were black African slaves that were transported on Barbarios, Ragusian, or Turkish ships to the capital of the port or to Smyrna. When these ships were captured, slaves were brought to the Isle of Paros and created many problems for the Russian military commandment. I saw many orders. Admiral offered all the officers to take Africans as their batmen, as their serfs. Some of them have taken these African uh, slaves, but then rejected to have them. Uh, the, uh, of, uh, the commandment order to use African slaves, women, in the hospital, uh, in uh, the laundry. But later, uh, Admiral Spirivitev preferred not to deal with this kind of prizes. Uh, and uh, the last uh, ship with slaves that was captured by the Russian just before uh, the peace treaty uh, was uh, uh, they decided to take only male slaves uh, for uh, the help of the military base, uh, but all women were transported to Smyrna to get rid of them. Although African children became very much in fashion as companions of aristocratic women in Russia. And uh, I found in the correspondence, it is a very rare uh, possibility to find the correspondence from St. Petersburg to Archipelago, private part of it. But uh, there, uh, there are some orders to relatives. Uh, when you will be returning back to Russia, you must buy in London good watches from uh, archipelago black African children and something else like silk and clothes, etc., etc. But English watches and black African children. And possibly Alexei Arlov, you can see his very well-known portrait in the upper part of this picture, uh, brought uh, to Russia one African because there is a portrait of a woman. This portrait is now in the State Historical Museum. But uh, uh, the author of this, pet port uh, of this portrait of a lady uh, is uh, uh, possibly not Develi. Uh, there is an, also an article about Tsofany who could have been mm, done, who, who could have done this portrait, but I am not an art historian uh, and cannot penetrate these discussions, but uh, we can see here a nice lady, possibly she is a, a wife of Alexey Arlov or his uh, future mistress, possibly. Uh, uh, never, uh, nobody knows, but this uh, uh, the picture is uh, uh, very well known uh, as a part of historical museum collections. So um, uh, the second, uh, the smallest part of my presentation is about uh, the changing image of middle of the Middle East. Uh, and 
I will start with a collection of maps. Uh, while working to create a state on the Archipelago Islands, Russians, Russian commanders uh, were actively engaged in describing and mapping the Eastern Mediterranean. It is uh, the book of uh, um, memoirs of journals uh, with a lot of about uh, uh, 25 maps like this uh, done by Russian Captain Khmitsevsky. Uh, this manuscript now is in uh, Vladimir and Suzdal Museum and uh, in the exhibition. Uh, and it is very notable. It is the best, I suppose, diary of this expedition done by its uh, member. Uh, here we can see uh, the map of the whole archipelago. There are maps of almost all the big islands. And um, uh, uh, just uh, this uh, a wonderful uh, view, I must to add to these previous views of Constantinopolis. Here we see it. Uh, and Dardanelles, of course, that was very important for Russians. This marble sea and the Dardanelles um, uh, that uh, uh, during uh, a short armistice, Russian officers managed to make some drafts of this, uh, uh, of these streets. Uh, so, um, uh, Russian interest in uh, to Middle East and precisely to its possibility to use separative rulers um, of this part of the Ottoman Empire was by no, by no means accidental. Uh, the interest appeared with the first news about Egyptian ruler Ali Bey. Uh, you know him, I suppose. Um, uh, and um, uh, his success in Egypt in uh, 1770. This success was discussed, discussed even in the correspondence of Catherine the Great and Voltaire. Soon it was seriously discussed several times in 1772 at the highest court council in St. Petersburg. Count Orlov started to set up first careful contacts with Ali Bey from autumn 1771. Late in spring 72, Orlov has sent a small squadron uh, Sorry. of Greek ships in order to help Ali Bey and this squadron without many difficulties banished Turkish troops and conquered Saida and Beirut. Uh, this is uh, uh, a part of the logbook of one of these small Greek ships, uh, it is Shebek Grecia, Greece, uh, that made the first map of the Haifa Bay. This is uh, San Jandakr Akko, and this is Haifa, with the camp of Ali Bey here. Uh, um, uh, so uh, my friend from uh, Jerusalem, Mitya Frumin, made a special article about this first map, map of the Bay of Haifa. They also made some maps of uh, uh, Saida and uh, Levantine Paysage, but like uh, these uh, small drafts uh, in a logbook. And uh, uh, one is colored, it is uh, the Russian Greek and Greek ships attack Beirut uh, in 1772. Uh, we can see not only uh, Levantine mountains and trees, but also very good picture of Russian ships. There are big inscriptions which ships uh, is uh, what and uh, uh, how they uh, managed to attack uh, the fortress of Beirut in 72. Then they left Beirut. Uh, only in uh, 1773, uh, when Ali Bey has been already uh, defeated, uh, deadly wounded and died, Two squadrons of Russian ships with some uh, artillery and troops again reached Lebanese coast, again managed to capture Beirut. So two times they captured this capital and uh, even to obtain written assurances of two Arab rulers to become subjects of Russian empress. One of them was Drusian Prince Yusuf Shihab. The second one was the ruler of Akko. Uh, it, uh, his um, uh, Sheikh Zahir al -Amar. 
Sheikh Zahir uh, uh, after uh, 74 when Russian troops left archipelago was uh, captured and killed. What was collected in the Middle East? Like first Russian Arab contacts, first Russian emissaries to the Near East also seemed to be adventurous. They, saw, uh, they uh, had no information about uh, this coast, about this part of Levant. Possibly they could read in their childhood some descriptions of Russian pilgrims to the Holy Land, but I doubt about it. Uh, so uh, one of them, Lieutenant Lvov, who was sent to draw maps of Arab coast uh, and up to the delta of uh, the Nile. Uh, then there was a Preobrazhensky officer, I suppose uh, German or Lithuanian by origin, Magnus Baumgarten. He did even to discuss with Arab, Arab princes uh, and Arab sheikhs accepting their lands under Russian protection. In general, for the Arab world, these contacts meant an overcoming of cultural and political isolationalism. Uh, for Russia, in inclusion of a new world into her cultural and international relations. But Count Alexey Arlov managed to make some profit for himself. He was interested in horses. We discussed yesterday about uh, this problem of horses. And uh, um, uh, that is why uh, the main aim of his envoy, Magnus Baumgarten, was not possibly maps of the coast, but to obtain Arabians and best horses for his commander, and only secondly, to make maps and observations. In fact, Count Alexey Arlov obtained many Arabians, including this very famous, for Russian uh, history, famous horse Smitanka. Uh, it is a picture of the 70s. Uh, he paid for one Ottoman imperial aristocrat. Uh, he paid. It is, he, this horse was not captured. It was uh, bought for 60 thousand rubles, at that time uh, a good uh, horse, uh, the price for a very good horse was 5,000. This was bought for 60 and with uh, very many precautions brought to Russia. And uh, uh, it uh, appeared to be uh, even the foundation of the Orlov Trotter, so it is famous and its sculpture decorates uh, the uh, nowadays uh, um, Orlov's um, uh, stables uh, in uh, Orlov Arlov, Arlov's in uh, uh, his uh, uh, former possessions. It is very well known that Arlov accepted horses with precious harness from Arab allies, including Druze princes. They uh, mention it in their letters to him. But unfortunately, I could find only the image of the harness sent to Catherine the Great but by Abdullah Hamid in 1775 when they celebrated the peace treaty of Kuchuk energy. Now it is in Kremlin museums. To conclude, beyond foreign affairs diplomacy and international military history, the documentation of the Russian archipelago expedition in 1769-1775 shows that the Russian empress wanted more than a glory of her victories. She desired visible pieces of the Mediterranean civilization in her palaces, as well as her aristocrats too. That is why among the important duties of the military men in this expedition uh, appeared the acquisition of marvels from this part of the world. Orthodox Greeks that appeared to be much spoiled by barbarous oriental culture became first art dealers of this specific market. Objects from, Levant, from the Levant didn't dramatically influence the lifestyle of Russian nobility. They desired ancient marbles from heroic Greeks, but finally were happy even with modest chests, bows, and arrows. 
The most important is that the image of the Levant since the end of the 18th century consisted not only of Christian objects of pilgrimage, as it was for centuries before, but of colored maps and day-to-day -day impressions. In next decades, this very image will influence the first Russian Orientalist works. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Elena, for your presentation. And please, if anyone has a question. Thank you so much for your most interesting presentation. Thank you. Um, I was, I, I, I didn't quite understand it's a very small point, but it might be interesting if you could just throw a bit more light on it. When you show those very interesting engravings of um, Greeks doing dancing, and you had the Russian version which was set in front of ruins, mm -hmm. would I be right in saying that those are not just any ruins, that those are among the most famous ruins in Athens? So that is the Temple of Olympian Zeus, and it's the Arch of Hadrian, as far as I can make out. Possibly it is a combination of two engravings yes. uh, in Russian, but I, uh, yep. uh, in, on Paris there are special collectors of these engravings of Greek dance of, on Paris. And they, she, she has collected uh, about uh, different, but uh, more than 12 prints from the early 18th century to, to the middle of the 19th century. And always this dance uh, was with, depicted nearby the boat, but without this temple. But in Russia, I found this only print, and uh, only in one uh, early 19th century book. And uh, it was never uh, copied, but in that mm -hmm. book, they appeared to combine it. They wanted to have this image with the ancient temple. I have no idea. Possibly it is from Athens. Or possibly no, it is. Yeah, I'm very it sure. From, it is uh, uh, yes. the Temple of Zeus. Fe temple of Zeus and the Arch mm -hmm. of Hadrian. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you very much. <laughs> it, is a, it is a good uh, <laughs> to know it. Thank you. Ask a question. Did you come through your research or the research across um, an interest for the, um, the Egyptian Christian, the Copts? Because there has been, at least later on in the 19th century, a kind of alliances and connection that go through the Orthodox Church because of, because of the achiness between the two churches. So, did you find any connection with that in the term of material culture? Uh, at this very time, because uh, actually I am a historian of political history of the Russian of the 18th century. Uh, but my mom, she is Orientalist, she is a specialist in Lebanon, and uh, it is her, her uh, area of studies. And, uh, uh, but uh, there, I know, if, according to my documents, that Arlov used Armenians and Italian uh, merchants in his connections with Ali B, and never used uh, Copts uh, in uh, Egyptian Christians. He, uh, possibly uh, he had a lack of information about them, and he preferred to use uh, Europeans who had their connections in uh, the Middle East. But uh, uh, if I find these materials, I would absolutely be uh, interested in them, but I have never found. Thank you. Uh, my question is about uh, Orientalism conception, and uh, I would like to ask you what are the or what were the original sources for the Russians to consider other nations and empires and countries and uh, ethnic groups as Orientals? Because uh, it's amazing that uh, Russia itself was uh, the subject of uh, Oriental, uh, it was treated or it was considered as Oriental country. I remember the debate between, uh, the, uh, between uh, Adib Khalid and Nathaniel Knight, 
whether Russia uh, was the subject of Orientalism or uh, so. Uh, for Western uh, countries, uh, I know there are some sources, but what were the original sources for Russia to consider others as Orientals? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, there is a problem, of course, for Europeans, <coughs> Russians were or absolutely Oriental, and we uh, read uh, Larry Wolf's this uh, depicting uh, the Eastern Europe, so Russian were Easterners, and uh, so uh, a lot of images of Russian had this. Uh, marks of Orientalism. And uh, even uh, British members of the expedition described how Russians uh, behaved their, uh, themselves in Greece. For example, uh, now I'm editing Admiral Elphinstone's uh, uh, papers and he uh, uh, depicted Russians to have baths, original Russian baths on Greek islands because both was a, just a sign of Russianness. And uh, he wanted uh, just to point out that British officers were others than Russians who were semi-Oriental, of course, because of their bathers. And uh, like Turks, they do bath. Uh, to have them once per week, but uh, of course a British officer wanted to have uh, his bath every day. Uh, that is uh, only a couple of marks like this. But Russian, for Russians, of course there was a division at first between Christians and non-Christians. And uh, when they interfered uh, the Mediterranean world, they considered that uh, not only Orthodox Greeks, but the whole uh, Christian Europe will help Russia to liberate Christians and to make, as Catherine II wrote to Greece, to, be, uh, to uh, create a new part of Pacta Christianica in Europe. Uh, she meant Balkan uh, Greeks. And uh, uh, when she found out that uh, French uh, government didn't want even to uh, help to, to accept even a single Russian ship in her ports, uh, that Maltese uh, order didn't want to accept any Russian ship in its port, only British Minorca helped Russians and uh, a free town, uh, city of Livorno helped Russians to just restore its ships, etc., etc. So uh, um, uh, at first, this idea of the Christian unity dissipated and disappeared, and uh, they appeared uh, Muslims in uh, Egypt and uh, uh, Sheikh Zakir Amar in Akko, who could help Russians better than European Catholics. And there appeared another attitude, and Greeks who betrayed Russians, who uh, didn't want to help them in uh, Peloponnesus. Uh, this was uh, uh, the difference. So uh, this image became uh, colored in different col uh, colors than it was before the beginning of the experience.